Hello, this is Brian Craig, and uh, this is a presentation about virtual court hearings. Uh, I am a full-time faculty member at Purdue University Global, and uh, in this presentation, I will be discussing how virtual court hearings are here to stay. So definitely a good topic. Kind of a starting place in this discussion, I, the facade to the U.S. Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. states equal justice under the law. And what exactly does that mean? And how does that impact courtrooms, and particularly with COVID-19 and, and how courts have responded to, to that? Well, the law is sometimes slow to respond to changes in technology. In fact, one judge wrote, in an article, he said, I'm an old judge and we tend to come a bit more slowly to technology changes. What Several reasons ex exist for that. One is federal judges have lifetime tenure. I've even heard about some judges who refuse to read email and require their assistant to manually print out all emails. So sometimes the law is a little bit slower to respond to, to changes in technology. However, the COVID-19 pandemic <clears throat> created a, a need to implement more technology. And this arose out of necessity, right? With the pandemic and uh, inability to uh, meet in person. Uh, as a result, we saw uh, a growth in video hearings and remote hearings. Now, certainly there were remote hearings that were done before March of 2020 and with closures, but we definitely saw a significant increase with the pandemic. Uh, we also saw an increase in the use of video depositions rather than doing depositions in person. Out of court testimony made under oath. Now, the variety of different video conferencing platforms that are available, uh, for example, a, a common one is Zoom. Uh, there's also WebEx, which is a Cisco product. There's Google Meet, YouTube, channels, Microsoft Teams, and Facebook Live. Those are just a few of them. The other ones exist, but those are some of the key players. Video hearings and WebEx hearings provide a lot of benefits. And there are also some disadvantages that we'll talk about today. So WebEx hearings, uh, one judge wrote, uh, WebEx hearings benefits lawyers as well as their clients. And the judge wrote here, judge uh, in, in Utah, uh, where I'm located, Judge Angela Fonsbeck, she wrote, by allowing attorneys and their staff to appear remotely for oral arguments, scheduling matters, status hearings, and reviews, attorneys are now able to be multiple places at the same time. More time in the office likely means more work getting completed and more billable hours. This increased productivity should be a boon to the entire system. You know, sometimes you just have a short scheduling hearing that's maybe five minutes, 10 minutes. Why do you have to drive an hour and get... Uh, both ways and and just for a, a short uh, scheduling conference or status hearing. So there are other benefits for video conferencing uh, hearings. It's easier to coordinate schedules with multiple participants, with lawyers and, and parties. Uh, it's more efficient, less travel time for hearings and for depositions. It also leads to more diversity uh, for some types of hearings. For example, I serve as a uh, pre litigation panel chairperson for medical malpractice cases in Utah. So we have panel members, including doctors, who serve on those panels. And instead of having just doctors who are in Salt Lake City, we're able to get doctors as far south as St. George and, and uh, elsewhere. And that leads to more diversity. And uh, again, there's a lot of uh, benefits and it, it, it's easier to coordinate multiple schedules. There are also security and emotional health benefits of video hearings. It can reduce uh, physical violence in courtrooms and reduce trauma for victims, uh, particularly in cases involving uh, criminal cases, like uh, domestic violence cases, family law cases can be very contentious, uh, protective orders and restraining orders. If you've ever seen uh, the TV show Court Cam, kind of highlights uh, some of those uh, confrontations that occur with uh, court proceedings. And those video hearings provides for uh, some benefits to the participants. However, with all these advantages, there are also some potential 
disadvantages and issues that arise, uh, particularly we have constitutional issues and constitutional yeah. considerations with video court hearings. Uh, particularly, we have concerns under the due process clauses under the 5th and 14th Amendments, the right to confront witnesses in criminal cases under the 6th Amendment, the right to counsel, the right to a speedy trial, and the right to a jury trial found in the 6th and 7th Amendments. Along with the U.S. Constitution, there are also state constitutional provisions. And you know, there's this metaphor that the state constitution or in the U.S. Constitution is more of a floor rather than the ceiling. So state constitutions in some situations can provide for greater rights, greater benefits to parties and to participants than the, the U.S. Constitution. So be sure to look under your state constitution as well. So kind of a starting place is we just look under the text of the Sixth Amendment states in all criminal prosecutions, the accused or the defendant shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him. So this is known as the confrontation clause in the Sixth Amendment. And kind of give some historical background about this. There was a US Supreme Court case back in 1990, long before we had even video hearings, we had an issue dealing with using a closed circuit television, one-way closed circuit television. And in a case called Maryland v. Craig in 1990, the US Supreme Court analyzed whether use of that one-way closed circuit television in a case denied the defendant of the Sixth Amendment right to the confrontation clause. Here, the court held that, that the Sixth Amendment confrontation clause did not prohibit a child witness in a child abuse case from testifying against the defendant at trial it would be very traumatic for that child to be able to testify in open court against the accuser or against the defendant by the accuser. Uh, justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female Supreme Court justice, wrote the opinion in Maryland v. Craig and wrote that in order for the Sixth Amendment confrontation clause uh, to be satisfied absent a physical face-to-face -face confrontation, uh, may be satisfied when one, the denial of such confrontation is necessary to further an important public policy, and two, the liability of the testimony is otherwise assured. So as long as we meet those two requirements under Maryland and Craig, then there's no Sixth Amendment confrontation clause violation. Uh, we've seen some more recent cases dealing with this and the right to confront witnesses in, in, with the COVID-19 pandemic. In a case out of uh, federal court, Court held that the need to prevent serious illness or death of witnesses or his family during COVID-19 was an exceptional circumstance, such that way that a two-way video conference would satisfy the defendant's right to confrontation. So again, in that case, the court allowed for a two-way video conference, no violation under the confrontation clause. We also have the due process clauses found in the Fifth Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the state constitutions. We see a language here under the 14th Amendment, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process. Now, we've seen other cases dealing with that. Uh, there was one case, a uh, federal court case out of the District of Columbia in 2021, United States v. Lattimore. This was a, a case dealing with a remote suppression hearing that was held by video. The court held that holding this remote suppression hearing did not deprive the defendant of his due process rights. And where there was a video hearing, defendant would have appeared on screen, would be able to communicate with the judge and counsel, be able to see and hear the proceedings, and would have been able to communicate with his attorney privately through a, a private chat breakout room. And you know, sometimes judges will put the, the lawyer and then the, the client, the participant in a separate breakout room to be able to discuss matters privately, not in the presence of other individuals or they can just use a chat box, also, which is a nice feature with the, the technology that's available. Uh, we saw another case here of using a, uh, a bench trial. Court held in this case uh, in, involving uh, from Michigan court that doing a bench trial in an, where you just have a judge, no, no jury, but in a bench trial in an environmental case, and this was a civil case by video conferencing during the pandemic would not have violated plaintiff's due process rights with a meaningful opportunity to confront and cross-examine witnesses. Again, it goes to due process. However, not all courts have been so open arms in accepting for video hearings. Uh, there was a Missouri Supreme Court case. This is a, a state case in 2022. 
involving a juvenile delinquency case. And in this case, the court held that requiring a juvenile defendant or uh, to attend an adjudication hearing by a two-way live video because of the COVID-19 pandemic violated that juvenile's due process rights under both the U.S. Constitution and the Missouri Constitution. In this case, the juvenile repeatedly asserted his right to be physically present in the courtroom at his adjudication hearing to defend himself. And the court denied him of that right. He said, I want to have an in-person hearing. He asserted that right. The trial court denied, appealed to the Missouri Supreme Court. This is your Missouri Supreme Court held that there was a violation. Now, that case, there's an interesting quote by the court, states that neither the United States Constitution nor the Missouri Constitution are entitled to take sick days. And I think that's a really great quote. And kind of looking at the Constitution, right, is that these constitutional rights are, are fundamental rights. And, you know, just because of, you know, certain situations that might arise, and again, it's going to depend on the facts and circumstances of each case, whether it's a, a suppression hearing or a full-blown adjudication that determines guilt or not guilty. Uh, in, in that case, for the Missouri Supreme Court, the court also stated that generalized concerns about a virus may not override the individual's constitutional right of due process to be physically present for his juvenile adjudication hearing, at which his guilt or innocence will be determined. So again, we see a different standard for just a remote suppression hearing versus or a status hearing or something like that versus the full-blown trial, right? Adjudication hearing, similar to the trial. So now the court did recognize that that right may be waived. You know, if the party did not assert that right at the trial court level, it could be considered waivers. It's always important to raise any of your, your issues at the trial court level and not raise for the first time on appeal. Uh, another quote from a federal appeals court case in 2020 stated that while the law may take periodic naps during a pandemic, will not let it sleep through one. And I, I thought that's an interesting quote. And that was a case dealing with uh, First Amendment rights and, and uh, to be able to gather. So, Now, what about the Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial? Well, we see in the Seventh Amendment, in certain civil cases, the right to a jury trial. But what if the court holds that by video conferencing instead of in person? Well, in this case, against... Uh, Amtrak, it was a lawsuit filed, and a jury awarded a passenger nearly $7 million, $6.85 million, in a case against Amtrak after a, a train derailment. And there, the court held that the decision to conduct a jury trial by video conferencing platform did not violate the Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial. Here, the defendant argued that using just the, the video conferencing software denied them of that Seventh Amendment right. The court held, in this case, was held via Zoom, that Zoom trials are not demonstrably more favorable to one sort of party rather than another. The novel determination that Zoom trials are inherently unconstitutional and the far-reaching consequences of such a ruling is a matter for a higher court. So basically, the trial court in that case said, no, we're, we're not going to find that there's a violation here in the Seventh Amendment. And you know, maybe an appellate court might decide differently, but we're not going to make a new law here. So again, that shows more judicial restraint rather than judicial activism. Uh, what about due process rights in other types of cases? Well, uh, again, it can be one factor in, in certain types of cases. There was a case out of Florida, a state court case, dealing with a, a hearing for termination of parental rights. And in this case, the court you know, evaluated different factors and, you know, here, the court held that a private interest factor weighed in favor of a determination that a due process violation occurred by using a video conferencing equipment because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, in that case, the court did not ultimately conclude that it was appropriate, um, you know, that there was a violation under due process rights, but it was one factor in the totality. Of the now, sometimes courts will do Kind of a hybrid approach, kind of a blending of in-person hearings and digital modes of interaction. For example, one way might be to do voir dire, or jury selection by video, but then have the actual trial in person. So instead of having you know 50 people in the courtroom, just do it for jury selection and for voir dire, just do it by video and then do the trial in person. Another way of doing this is having maybe some jurors attend in person and other jurors attend virtually. 
and do a mix of that. Or sometimes you just have some witnesses who will testify by Zoom or other video conferencing software. Maybe if a witness is unavailable, if they're sick that day or something like that, if it's a, a trial that's going on multiple days, that might be an option as well. Uh, what about masking of jurors? Is that a violation? Well, that's a good question. Uh, there was a case out of Pennsylvania State Court where the appeals court concluded that the trial court acted within its discretion of during voir dire or jury selection and did not de violate defendant's constitutional right to a fair and impartial jury when, because of the pandemic, permitted potential jurors to wear a face mask. So wearing a face mask of covering person's mouth and, and, and nose using a, a surgical mask uh, or other type of mask did not deny defendant of that right to jury trial. Uh, some courts are creative, but also using the jury, in lieu of using the jury box, would just use the, the entire gallery to allow for more social distancing and, and spreading a part of, of jurors. Uh, there was a case uh, also here where the court held that in, in that same case, where the jurors uh, sat in the gallery of the courtroom about 30 feet from the witness stand during the duration of the trial because of the pandemic. The court said no violation of right to jury trial. So there the court allowed for social distancing of jurors in a farther distance. They were still in the same courtroom, but spread out. What about muting of participants? Now, now the great feature with hearings by video is judges have the ability to mute participants. Now, some judges maybe for in-person hearings would like to have that option too, if they could have a magic little button on their on their bench to mute participants. But with technology, you have that ability. Uh, well, there was a case out of the Eighth Circuit Federal Appeals Court case in 2022, where the, the, the trial court judge muted the audio of the defendant during a sensing hearing. And this was a sensing hearing by video conferencing, where the defendant appeared remotely because of the pandemic. And there, the court held that muting the defendant did not violate due process rights of the defendant. He was muted uh, because he was disrupting that portion of the hearing when he was not expected to speak. He had an opportunity to speak, but it was not his turn. And he was speaking out of turn in that case. And the court held that muting of the defendant did not adversely affect his attorney's ability to urge a favorable sentence. So if somebody's acting up, a judge can mute that participant. Besides these constitutional issues, there are also some logistical concerns with video here. Zoom and other platforms uh, sometimes have security and privacy breaches and concerns. We also have a number of people who live in, in rural areas who simply don't have access to high-speed internet and doing video hearings and, and maybe they just don't have access to that. Uh, maybe people who live in rural areas or engineer parties, people who don't have money for high-speed internet or uh, hardware or software to be able to do that. Uh, maybe even some smaller or, or solo law firms. In fact, approximately two, 42 million Americans live outside the reach of broadband service. So that creates some logistical challenges and concerns with doing video hearings. You also have some individuals who are restricted from using the internet, maybe as conditions of uh, pretrial release or parole or probation, for example, individuals who are convicted or, or charged of child pornography might be restricted from, from using the internet or any electronic devices. So one way of addressing these concerns is by using kiosks. So in some courts, the ability to appear remotely, maybe if, instead of having to travel you know, to a different part of the state, you can, a person can just go to a, a video uh, participate in a video court hearing by just using a kiosk, kind of similar to the old school uh, phone booths. So uh, on the slide here, we just have a, a, some kiosks in a Utah courthouse where court patrons can participate in virtual court hearings. So, and those kiosks are now being installed throughout the state and other locations to facilitate virtual hearings for those people who don't have the ability or don't have the technology or, or uh, maybe they've had a hearing and then the, the, uh, the technology isn't working well, so the judge will just continue that and, and reschedule it for another day. And 
then allow the participant to be able to attend remotely just by using one of those kiosks. Um, so again, the pandemic forced remote court hearings, but now they're here more to stay. Uh, another option would be in, instead of the client uh, using their own electronic device could go to the lawyer's office and then appear just in the lawyer's office by video. So that's another option too. Uh, we do have some, some issues that arise with video hearings, a lack of decorum and lack of respect. We see this in in-person hearings too, but uh, even more frequently, I think sometimes people take video hearings a little bit less serious and they should remember that they are participating in a, a court hearing, whether it's in person or whether it's by video. Uh, one Utah judge wrote, we regularly see pajamas, torn or ripped clothing, revealing or sexually provocative attire, clothing with vulgar sayings or pictures, or sometimes no clothing at all, right? So if you're going in for your uh, criminal case, you don't want to be wearing a t-shirt that has a marijuana leaf on it, right? If you're accused of, of uh, drug dealing, right? And, uh, you know, with different situations like that, you know, just act professionally as if you were appearing for this good counsel to consider. Um, now there are other other considerations and, and criticisms of video court hearings. They're not the uh, greatest for certain apps, applications. One prosecutor even wrote pandemic solutions to increasing criminal jury trials while noble in intention still likely force the accused to either waive his six amendment rights to choose a speedy trial right at the expense of the competition right or jury right, potentially causing prosecutors and defense attorneys to shirk their ethical obligations to seek justice or zealously represent their clients. So, you know, sometimes, you know, some people have, have criticized use of these video hearings. Um, some judges require defendants to appear by video when entering a guilty plea rather than just appearing by phone or audio. And, and that's, you know, largely up to the discretion of the judge. Some people have also worried that using video conferencing software inhibits the ability of, of defendants to speak with their, their lawyers and might affect that Sixth Amendment right to counsel and also might inhibit defendants' understanding of the process, uh, confrontation clause, witnesses, prejudice, perceptions. Of the... So, and those are legitimate concerns. I think it's important you know, to consider adaptation in the law, right? And uh, this is from a judge in, in Australia who wrote, just because one cannot have a hearing conducted in accordance with traditional practices and procedures does not mean that the court's judicial function cannot be performed effectively where it is necessary to do so. As Voltaire, the um, French philosopher, observed, one must ensure the, perf the perfect does not become the enemy of the good, right? So, you know, again, advantages and disadvantages with video court hearings, we see. And largely, judges will have discretion on whether to allow certain types of hearings to be held by video and which are best face-to-face. -face. One judge wrote, judges will continue to exercise discretion about what types of cases are best heard by video or face-to-face. -face. For example, a party might file a motion to appear remotely if they can show good cause, you know, maybe based on significant distance or, or something. And again, you know, that's subject to appeal, but most likely would be which is a higher standard. There are also ethical considerations for lawyers and their staff. Rule 1.1 of the ABA Model Rules of Professional Conduct, which many states have adopted, deals with duty of competence. In fact, it states the rule, this ethical rule, a lawyer shall provide competent representation to a client. Competent representation requires the skill, knowledge, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for the representation. So this includes a duty of competence of knowing how to use technology. And sometimes people struggle with technology. And there was a news article, and some of you might have followed that, where this one lawyer in Texas, he struggled with a cat filter. And he had this cat filter on his electronic device, on his computer, and he struggled with the disabling. And he was telling the judge, I'm, judge, I'm, I'm not a cat. And, and it's actually led to some, some memes and, and uh, on social media. But um, again, it's important to for lawyers and their staff, paralegals that help lawyers to know how to use technology and to be able to, to address those issues. Another ethical concern is found in rule 3.5 of the ABA model rules that prohibits a lawyer from engaging in conduct intended to disrupt a tribunal. So how could a lawyer disrupt a virtual court hearing? Well, maybe if they're uh, 
their, their background is inappropriate, maybe if they're acting inappropriately uh, during that, that hearing. So you just wanna act professionally, uh, just as if you were in the physical court. Now, what about uh, students who are studying about the law, whether paralegal students or legal assistants or those planning to, to work in the legal field? Well, uh, you know, we can look at, at ways, uh, and we try to implement that in some of our courses here at Purdue University Global. I teach a course in civil litigation, for example. So uh, some of the different issues that we might discuss in that class include helping to draft motions to appear remotely, scheduling and sending links, a paralegal might help with testing technology, preparing exhibits, uh, especially like big medical malpractice cases um, that I help with. Sometimes we have hundreds of pages of, of medical records in those exhibits. And sometimes we'll do base numbering or base stamping, which basically puts a, a sequential page number for voluminous records at the bottom of the document. Um, a paralegal or legal system might also help prepare lawyers and clients and witnesses prepare, prepare for those video hearings. Maybe may also helping prepare and schedule conference rooms. And also consider use of 3D models. 3D models can still be used. If somebody holds up a three-dimensional model, even during a video hearing can be very effective. Or maybe if they have other demonstrative evidence that they can just display on the screen. And again, it might be helpful in some cases to draft a motion to appear remotely. So for example, a party might file a motion to appear remotely that says good cause exists for this party to appear remotely. The party currently resides in whatever city and state, which is located you know, 200 miles or however miles from the court location. Based on some distance, the party requests to be able to be permitted to appear remotely at the scheduled hearing. So it may be even consider attaching an ex exhibit of a distance between the, those locations, maybe using Google Maps or other map feature. So that might be on a motion to appear remotely, and, and the judge can consider that. Maybe contact opposing party to see if they'll grant that. And kind of some final thoughts here about video court hearings. Uh, there's a quote here from a, an article from uh, the Wyoming Lawyer, the, uh, a board journal article. It states the pandemic has taught how to run the justice system efficiently in many respects with virtual proceedings. The pandemic is not the disruption courts wanted, but it's the disruption that courts needed to reimagine the court services and advance operations into a better future. So I think that's a really good quote, right? Is And that the pandemic you know, created this necessity to be able to adapt. And sometimes, again, the legal field is a little slow to adapt. So that's just a short presentation about virtual court hearings here to stay. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me or um, your instructor. Uh, these are just some additional references of, under some of these uh, articles that I used in this presentation. If you're interested in learning more, uh, again, uh, feel free to, to contact me. My name is, is Brian Craig, and you can email me at bcraig at global.edu. Thanks so much for attending, and uh, look forward to seeing how courts will continue to respond to technology in the future. Thanks so much.